opportunity to teach again. This is a privilege of mine. I've been working on this for quite some time. Uh, you can see the subject here we're talking about is what is the extent of God's sovereignty? Uh, Pastor Sean is at camp. He's teaching there. And, uh, and so I get the privilege to share with you this message today. It's been on my mind for a long time as we uh, often question God's sovereignty, right? And the question I have is, is there limits to what God is controlling? Is God in control of everything? Or is there some things that God just doesn't control? Doesn't, he leaves out. You know, these questions are always brought up to the fair. You know, if, if there's a God, why are things like they are? Why, why are they bad? Why is this an unraveling mess, this world? So it brings up the question, even in is sovereignty in our lives, the details of our lives, whether you get pregnant or whether you get married or, or whether you die. I mean, everything is, you wonder, is God in control? Does he know what he's doing? And is he in control? Some of these areas that people question, uh, some possible limitations that people question is, is, is because of the world population. I was this slide is kind of dark. Because of the world population, is it becoming too overwhelming for God? You know, we know that from ancient times that there was, a, there was about uh, 40 million Jews that came out of the Exodus and about 3 million Egyptians, give or take a few millions. And we know that the world now today, the current numbers in the world today is about 8 billion people, a little over 8 billion people. And we know that some 70,000 people are born, uh, I should say 68 million people are born a year, and 34 million die. So we're gaining, net gaining in our population, some 33 million, just about 34 million people a year. So the population of the world is growing. And this is... To a lot of people, this is not sustainable. You know, in, in 30 years, we're going to grow by another billion people. And they say when we hit that 10 billion mark, that it's un, totally unsustainable. What about uh, these catastrophic earth events that have been happening? What, did, what role is God playing in all this? It just seems like that there's some uh, weather-related things. There's some other things related to it. And it just seems like it's out of control. Is God just let it go? Is he just give up on it? Another one is, is climate change. You know, we hear all about climate change. You know, the storms seem to be much fiercer than they've ever been. And according to the scientists, as you watch the news, uh, we've had some of the hottest temperatures on record recently. And what about pain and agony? I mean, is, it, is, why is there so much pain and agony in our world today? Is it possible that, that God is overwhelmed with all these people and all these emotions? That, you can imagine 8 billion people in dealing with all these issues and problems. And we all deal with all this every day. So how do we, how do we answer all these questions? What about Satan's control? We know in the Bible in 2 Corinthians it says, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, it says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, who's the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. Satan, this is Satan's world. Has God given up and let Satan take over? I mean, these are all legitimate questions. And man seems to be rejecting God. You know, we see more and more that man is turning away from God. Churches are folding up. Things are just becoming much worse. And we see this all over the world. So what is the solution to all these issues? Some possible solutions we see are controlling the number of people in the world. Now this is, this is a perspective of the world now where I'm getting at here. If 10 billion people are going to be on this world and it's unsustainable, we've got to do something. So uh, there's many different ways to control population. And what about global dominance? Global dominance, where a single power source is controlling all that people do, say, and speak. 
a world domination. You know, we're headed this direction too as well. So we have all these problems. Where is God? And all these issues were created by man. We must fix these. Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve our problem with the same thinking we used when we created them. We got these problems. But the question I have for you is, have we forgotten God? Have we forgotten what the Word of God says? Have we forgotten a divine viewpoint thinking that we need? Because our minds don't work like God, do, do they? For our thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. See, our, our brains don't think like God does, so it's hard for us to comprehend all this, isn't it? So if you want to turn over in your Bible to Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at some verses here. We're going to do a lot of, uh, I'm going to have a lot of verses on PowerPoint slide, and we're going to answer these questions. Romans chapter 1. First in your handout, we want to define the word sovereign. So, so everyone knows what we're talking about here. The word sovereign. The word sovereign is, uh, is a word that means God possesses all power and is the ruler of all things. God rules and works according to his eternal purpose. He alone is in absolute control and can accomplish whatever he pleases. That's what this word sovereign means. You know, as you do a word search on this, the word sovereign, it only comes up one time in the New King James Version in 1 Samuel chapter 14 in relation to Saul setting up his kingdom. He establishes sovereignty over the land, it says. What it means is, is sovereignty means in that regards is his kingship or his rulership, his royal position. The word sovereign... Charles Ryrie had to say this about sovereignty. Sovereignty is not a property of a divine nature, but a prerogative arising out of the perfections of a supreme being. If God be a spirit and therefore a person, infinite, eternal, and immutable in his being and perfections, the creator and preserver of the universe, he is a right, it's absolute sovereign, infinite wisdom, goodness and power, with all the right of possession, which belongs to God and all his creatures, are the immutable foundations of his dominion. Our God is in the heavens. He had done whatever he pleases. So that brings us up to the next question, is what is the biblical approach to all these problems? We can look at them on a worldly perspective and it becomes overwhelming. It just becomes uh, unfathomable. How do we solve all these problems? And God, are you in control? So we look at who God is, and we look at these divine attributes of God. We see these divine attributes in this slide. We see that God is veracity. It means God cannot lie. We see he's immutable. It means he, he doesn't change. He's omnipresent, uh, omnipotent. He's also omniscient. We see that he's sovereign. See that he's holy, he's just. He's love and he's eternal. I mean, all these things are attributes of a supreme God. And these attributes are components, are not component parts of God, but they are his entire being. I mean, you remove one of these, you're not describing God. And that's none of these attributes contradict each other. Where do we find these attributes? We know they're in the Word of God. They're in the Word of God. You're turned over to Romans chapter 1. We want to see, we want to understand God and His character and attributes. And we see in Romans chapter 1, it's on the PowerPoint here as well, but if you read it from the Word of God, for the wrath of God in verse 18, Romans 1 verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed. Notice these words, is revealed. These are our present tense Passive voice. It means this is done to you and me. In indicative. Present tense active or present tense passive voice. So it's being shown to you. It's revealed to you from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. 
Why? Because what may be known of God is manifest. Notice again, it's the present tense, passive voice indicative. It's manifested in them, for God has shown it to them and to us. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, and his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Mankind is without excuse. Because they, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor are they thankful because they, become, they were futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. They did not trust God. They did not believe in God. They did not place their faith in the Savior. Some more verses on God's attributes. And, and Psalms 97, 1 through 6. On this slide, it's kind of hard to see. I didn't realize that. But Psalms 97, 1 through 6 says, The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goes up before him, burns up the enemies around him. The heavens declare the righteousness of all the people who see his glory. And this is the character of God. Psalms 139, 7 through 8. Say, where should I go from your spirit? The psalmist was talking about his position before God. Whether I flee from thy presence... If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall the hand lead me and the right hand shall hold me. You see, we can take comfort, point B of your handout, in knowing that God is working behind the scenes, all this out for eternal purpose, his eternal purpose and value. We know Romans 8.28 it says, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord. Psalms 115, these verses are all on your handout uh, for your reference as well. Psalms 115 says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For, your, for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is our God? Our God is in heaven and he does what he pleases. He does what he pleases. We can take comfort in knowing that God is working all things out according to his pleasure and he does what he pleases. Job 42 2 says, I know you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. This was Job's conclusion after his long trial. See, but God wants us to understand and know him through his word. He wants us to know his will, his desires. So that we can worship him, we can glorify them. You know, all, although God is sovereign over all, he still gives you and I a volition. We still have to make decisions. And we're going to expand on volition down the road here. But what we're talking about right now is God's sovereignty, his control of all this. And we can understand God's will. He wants us to know his will. Acts 13.22 Paul, preaching at Antioch, said, And when he had removed him, he raised up from them David as king, to whom he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. You know, in order to do the will of God, we have to know the will of God, right? Did David know the will of God? Can we know the will of God? Yeah, we can know the will of God. We have to know it in order to do it. You see, the sovereignty of God finds an expression not only in the divine, divine will of God, but also in his omnipotence of God and the power of, of, to execute his will. That's where, the, that's where the sovereignty of God finds his expression. We see this in Galatians 1, 3 through 5. This is really neat. Grace, be to, grace to you and peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Talking about the cross. That he might deliver us from the present age according to the will of our God. He wants to deliver us 
from this present age. Jesus Christ went to the cross. He died, and it is his will that we place our faith in the Son so that we can have eternal life. That's the will of God for us. That's birth. That's his purpose. This word will here in the Greek means it's his purpose or his intent is God. So you ask, well, how do we know God's will in the rest of our life? How do we understand God's will? See, God has a perfect plan for you and for me, for each and every one of us. Again, his will is found in his word. Apart from God's word, we are just like the rest of the world, looking for solutions to all these problems that are just overwhelming us, that are eating our lunch. But instead, he wants us to know his desires. We sang that song, trust his word. All God's promises are true, trust his word. No matter what, we can trust his word. God's will also, as we see in John 6, 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everything, or everyone who sees the Son and does what? Believes in him will have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. I'll raise him up in the last day, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, God's will for us is to know the gospel and to believe it, to trust his word. Jesus said to them, in, this is in uh, context of Jesus telling the Pharisees who doubted that Jesus Christ, or did not believe Jesus Christ was God, he said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent it, if anyone wills to do his will. See, it's a choice. We have a choice to will to do the will of God. He shall know concerning doctrine, the word of God, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. If anyone wills to do his will, again, a choice, a volition, to do his will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding. Our understanding is worldly, right? But he wants us to, to know and have direction in our lives so that we can know his will each day. So what is the extent of God's sovereignty? We're going to look at some different uh, areas here because I want to express to you and show you that God didn't leave nothing out. He didn't miss any details. He's sovereign over all. And we're going to see that. We're going to turn to some scriptures here. He's sovereign over creation and nature. Turn over to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. I'm going to see in this passage of Scripture, uh, Job has been uh, tried by God, or by Satan. God allows Satan to try him. And Job has been questioning God for the previous few chapters here. And now God is going to answer Job. God is going to have his time before Job, and he's going to answer the questions that Job has. And we see in Job chapter 38, in verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Words without knowledge. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined the measurements? Surely you know, Job. Or who stretched a line upon it? To what, where its foundations were fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, the creation of the world. Or who shut in the sea with the doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, the thick darkness and swaddling band. When I fixed my limit for it and I set bars and doors. When I said, this far you have come, but no further. And here the proud ways must stop. 
You see, God spent two chapters here telling Job that I, I am the one who made all this. I am in total control. You are nothing, Job. You're nothing. Turn over to, uh, a couple chapters to chapter 40. I'm going to see a summary question here in, in chapter 40 of Job. And, uh, verse 2 says, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty God correct him? God is asking Job, are, are you anybody that can correct me, God? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. And Job answered and said to the Lord, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. See, Job was, he abhorred himself, he says, because he was totally embarrassed of what a fool he was before God. It's not a good question, or not a good idea to question God. Job found this out. So we see God is sovereign over his creation. He's sovereign over nature. He's sovereign over his creation that he made. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by your will they exist. By your will they exist, and we're created. Revelation 4.11. Verse in Nehemiah says, You are... You alone are the Lord. You have made heavens, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. The host of heaven worships you. So you see, God is sovereign over his creation, over nature, and he's also sovereign over mankind. You know, God is behind every detail in our life from giving us life to, to taking our life, to allowing us to die. Have you ever wondered what your life would be like if you were born in, let's say, North Korea or China or someplace that isn't so free as where you're at right now? It wouldn't be much fun, would it? it you, you wonder why God placed you in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Turn over in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. You've got Samuel, Kings, and then the Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. You see, God is working all these details out. Here's what David had to say about the sovereignty of God. In First Chronicles chapter 29, we're going to read verses 10 through 13. Verses 10 through 13. This is after David took power. He is the new king of Israel. He said, Therefore God, David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness of the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and all in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you shall be exalted as head over all. Notice now, both riches and honor come from you. You reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. You see, God is in control of all of this. Strength, power, might, his creation. He's in control of us. You ever wonder why you had a certain gift? You know, maybe you're really talented at something. You ever wonder where that come from? God is sovereign. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. Moses, in refuting God, saying, God, I just can't lead the children of Israel out of bondage. I can't do it. Because I'm not an elegant speaker. I'm not a leader, God. This just isn't me. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have I not, Lord? Have I not, Lord? Lord is control of, all of every aspect of 
who you are and why you are the way you are. James 4, verses 13 to 15 say, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. You do not know. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, our time is in the Lord's hands. He's sovereign over your life. Instead, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that for His glory. For His glory. He's in charge of every aspect of your life. He's sovereign over all. He's also sovereign over history and nations. Turn over to Acts chapter 17. We're going to see some how he's sovereign over history and nations. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Paul was here standing in the the midst of Areopagus, and he said in verse 22, he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing. Him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with man, nor is worshipped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all, breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men, notice that, from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. In God's sovereignty, he placed you here in Grand Rapids. We see in Isaiah 40, 15 in this slide, Behold, the nations are a drop in the bucket. They are counted as dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the aisles as a very little thing. He The nations are just a drop in the bucket. All nations before him are nothing. See, he controls, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 through 8, speaking about the nation of Israel. Moses said, You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord our God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in numbers than any other people, for you were the least of the people. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeem you from the house of bondage, from the hand of the king of Pharaoh. Israel, God's chosen people. You know, God has a sovereign plan for the nation of Israel. This slide here shows us that God has a, a plan for everything. The purposes of God in human history, in his creation, the church, the creation of Israel and the nations and the world. And he has a perfect plan of redemption for the church. He's got a plan for you and for me and nations and creation. He's got a plan for the universe. He's got a plan for salvation for you and for me. He's got a plan for Israel, a plan that's sovereign for Israel. He's got a plan for the church, this church age, you and me. He's got a plan for the angels. He's got a plan for the demons. And there's a purpose in all this plan It's for his glory. It's all for his glory. You think this this, this seems as we're going through this and we've seen just how overwhelming God's control is that, that it takes man volition 
out of the picture, but we're, we're going to expand on that in the next message. And we're not going to have time for that today, but we're going to see that you have a responsibility in all this. What about God's sovereignty over angels? Is he sovereign over his angels? The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you as angels. You mighty ones who do the bidding, who obey his word. You know, angels can't create stuff. They cannot change substances. They cannot alter the laws of nature. They cannot perform miracles. They cannot act without means. They cannot search the heart of men. They're not omniscious. In Scripture, they're declared to be prerogatives, particular, their goal is to maintain the prerogatives of God. They're here for God's glory, to work in God's bidding, to do God's bidding. God is in control of his angels. Now, it gave angels Free will. We know a third of them fell with Satan, Lucifer, and we're going to see that here shortly. But they have limitations to what they can do. They are under God's authority. God is sovereign over these angels. For we know all things were, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, and by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Angels. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things, including the adversary, Satan. Is God sovereign over Satan? Yes. Satan is the head of the demon world. He's led their rebellion when a third of them fell. And he's propagating evil throughout the world right now. Now, Satan's a tremendously powerful person. And God allows this power for a certain reason. He's called the devil. He's called the serpent. He's called the great dragon, the prince of power, the god of this age. He's got all these titles. But like other angels and demons, Satan is invisible and he's highly intelligent and very powerful, but he's under the sovereign will of God. He can't do anything unless God approves of it. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Verse taken from Genesis 3, 15. The God of peace shall bruise. It's coming. Satan's day is coming. Where he is going to be judged. Now is the time for judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up, from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. A glorious time in the rapture when Jesus comes back and takes his church home and the judgment of this world starts. We see in Job chapter 1, verses 7 through 12, when Job's trial started, it says, The Lord said to Satan, Where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth. And walking back and forth. And the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth. He is blameless, upright, who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan answered and said to the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not placed a hedge around him and his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch your hand out and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your faith. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. He granted him, he gave him permission to test Job. Only do not lay a hand on his person, his life. could not take his life. So God allowed this trial with Satan. God is totally sovereign over Satan. How about, is God sovereign over sin? Is he sovereign over sin? The story of Joseph we're familiar with in Genesis chapter 45, where Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. And his brothers thought they'd never see Joseph again. 
But Joseph rose to power in Egypt. And him and his, or his brothers came to Egypt looking for food while there was a famine in the land. In Genesis 45, verses 5 through 8, it says, But now, do you not therefore be grieved? This is Joseph speaking to his brothers. Don't be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. God sent me here before you to do what? To preserve life. God sent me to preserve your life. God used their sin for good. For these two years, the famine had been in the land, and there have been still, there's still five years left to go, guys, in which there'll be neither plowing or harvesting. But God sent me before, before you to preserve a prosperity for you in the earth and to save your lives with a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of all his house, a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph gained great favor with Pharaoh. Later in verse 50 of Genesis, David said, But as for you, my brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day, to save many people's lives. Is God sovereign over sin? Yes. But you remember, God never condones sin, but he does allow it. He never condones sin. Acts 22 is a good example, or Acts 2.22 is a good example. Men in, of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. And as you yourselves know, that this Jesus, this Jesus Christ delivered up according to a definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. Foreknowledge of God. Prognosco means to know beforehand or before know. You crucified and killed by the hands of the lawless man. God raised him up, loosened the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by this. God's power is much more strengthened. He allowed, in his foreknowledge, in his sovereignty, Jesus Christ to be taken by these men and to be crucified for your and my salvation. What about our present day life? Pastor touched on this last Sunday about suffering. Our present day life, 1 Peter 3.15 says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. This earnest expectation that we know that someday God is coming back and we're going to spend eternity with him away from this pain and suffering and sorrow with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, and when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile you, good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, it is the will of God to suffer than to do evil. This is the will of God for you and for me. Is to do his will. Turn over to Romans chapter 9. We're going to see a few more verses. Romans chapter 9, verse 17. Context of Israel here. Israel past. Romans chapter 9, verses 17. We're going to read 17 through 19. Is God sovereign over our present day life? For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up. God raised up Pharaoh that I might show my power in you, and that by my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whoever he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Who will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? You see, God uses people. He raises people up for certain plans to be raising you up right now for a specific purpose in the plan. He's sovereign in your life. 
He used Pharaoh. He raised Pharaoh up for a specific plan with the nation of Israel. What about time? Is God limited? Is he not sovereign over time? We know in Matthew chapter 8, the story of the demons that were coming out of the tombs from the demon-possessed man, and they were all around. And these demons were asking Jesus, have you come to torment us before our time? You know, they know that someday they're going to be cast forever in a lake of fire. David said in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 20 and 21, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of our God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He changes the time. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them to no understanding. God is in control of all this. Paul, at the end of his life in 2 Timothy, knew his time was about up. He said in verses 6 through 7, For I am ready, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and my time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Paul knew his time was up. God is sovereign over time. We know Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest. All of this, God's sovereign over, sovereign over all of this. So how do we know that God is in still in control? What other attributes we see in our handout, what are the things can show us that he is in complete power. It's because of God's position of who God is. God's position, because of his position, uh, Psalms 97, verses 1 and 2, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitudes of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. It's his position. God's sovereignty. He reigns. Let the people tremble. He is reigning on the throne. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them praise you for your great and awesome name. He is holy. Because of God's position, He is holy. He is on the throne. Also because of His great pleasure. We know that God is in control because of it's his great pleasure. You and I are God's pleasure when we are serving him. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Psalms 115.1 For our God is in heaven. He does all that he pleases. He is doing all this for his pleasure. For we know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heavens and earth, in the seas and all the deep places. God is sovereign over all. He, for His pleasure. For His pleasure. Another reason we know that He is in control of all is because His dominant power. His dominant power. Second Chronicles 20.16 says... 20 verse 6 says, O Lord God of our Father, are you not in heaven and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? He is the God of heaven. He is ruling over all the nations. All of it's in his control. His dominant power for by him all things were created. We've seen this earlier. He created all things. How do we know God is still in control? Because of his amazing care. Matthew 20, 29 speaks of this pharaoh for the, or the sparrow. For the, are not the two sparrows sold for one penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of father's care. Every, even the very hairs of your head 
are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than any sparrows. God's got our back. He's caring for us. He's caring for us. You know the story of, of Isaac and Jacob. And we know that uh, the angel of the Lord appeared before Abraham, I, I'm sorry, Abraham and Isaac, and he said, do not lay a hand on your son. Do not kill him. Do not withhold your son. Abraham lifted up his eyes and God had a ram stuck in the thicket. He says, take this ram and sacrifice this ram instead. God provided a perfect sacrifice instead of Isaac. So he asked this question, why are there sufferings and evils in the world? Didn't have room in your handout to put this, but why? Why is all this in the world? We know it's because of Satan. He's the, the God of this world. God is allowing him to control certain things in this world. And we know also because of man's original sin in the garden. Man's original sin, Genesis chapter 3. And we know that they're suffering in the world because of other people's sins. And even our own sins. And that we, there's suffering for righteous sake. And there's evil and suffering in the world because that is the, that's, what, that's God's sovereign purpose. This is why. When man fell in the garden when he sinned, it went from a perfect relationship where God was enjoying a relationship. Adam and Eve had a free will. They chose to disobey God. So you and I no longer have a free will. We have volition. We're sinners. We can't change that. Now we have a volition to choose one way or the other. I want to show this real quick in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 through 11. This, the will of God. I, Paul exclusively talks about this in the Ephesians to the church at Ephesus. And he wants to make known the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. That in this dispensation of the fullness of times, when this dispensation, the church age, the grace age is ended, he might gather together one, all things in Christ, both are in heaven and on earth to him. In him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things out for the counsel of his will. We're predestined. But you know, predestined doesn't mean that you did not have a choice. It simply means that God knew what you were going to choose in this omniscience. We still have to make a choice. We have a volition. Can God's will be understood? Yeah, certainly can. Starting with his perfect will. You know, God has a perfect will for you and for me. A perfect will. Where is this perfect will found? In the word of God. We know that Genesis 131, and God seen everything he made and said it was very good. It was very good. It was perfect. Was this God's will for man to sin? No. Because of man's sin, we're living in this sin-cursed world now where there's death. There's evil. But someday... God is going to reclaim the earth, his treasure. Someday all will be well again. This is the will of God who sent me that I should lose none of them, but I'll raise them up in the last day. For my Father's will is everyone who looks at the Son and does what? Believes in him shall have what? Eternal life. Volition. We have. His perfect will for us is we place our faith in the Son. And also, Ephesians 5 says, redeeming the time. This is God's perfect will because the days are evil. Therefore, now, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is for you. This is his perfect will for you and for me. But also, he has a permissible will. A permissible will. God is allowing things to happen in our lives for his glory. You know, we may not even know just imagine the scene someday when you're in heaven 
And Jesus recalls us seeing something happen in your life, how you escaped the, the danger of a, a rolling tractor that could have run you over and killed you. And he tells you that I stopped that tractor from running you over. You could have died. It's going to be just great, wonderful to understand our whole lives, ain't it? To see as he unfolds our life, to see what he permitted in our lives. You know, he allows his permissible will, he allowed Adam to fall in the garden, right? He allowed him to sin. He allowed Satan to test Job. He allows death. He allows Israel to be made captive. Just think about that. The nation of Israel, his chosen people, are taken into captivity. He allowed that. You know, he, Paul endured in his missionary journey, he endured many, many trials in ministry for Christ. And you would think that if he's serving the Lord, this would be easy. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't smooth sailing for Paul. How will God's will be understood? The Spirit of the Lord departed Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. He was troubled. Because he was not serving God. And his servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. He permitted this troubling spirit upon Saul, the king of Israel at the time. And then the multitude rose up together in Acts 16, verse 22, and the magistrates rent their clothes off and commanded to beat them. Paul is getting beaten for his ministry. Did God allow that? Could he have stopped that? What about his providential will? His providential will. We know the story of Esther and how she was placed in that situation for a time like this. The Jews were going to be eliminated from the world because of his providential will through a queen named Esther. The Jews were saved. Isaiah 46, 3 and 4 says, For whom I have upheld since your birth and you carried since you were born, even to your old age and your gray hairs, I am he. I am he. I am the one upholding you. I am the one who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. That's a caring God. That's a loving God. What does this all mean to you and me? Put three things up on the screen there for your handout. Even though things seem out of control, I can take comfort in knowing that our God is still on the throne. He's still on the throne. 1 Timothy 1.7 And when we apply these biblical truths by faith, the results will be we can praise God all the day, no matter what our situation is. Whether it's a blessing from God, something works out in your life where, man, this is great, Lord. He opens a door for you. God feels our pain along with our gladness and he deeply loves us, promising never to leave us, never to leave us and forsake us. This is our God. He knows us, we can praise him, and we can trust his promises. So in conclusion, as we look at these issues, and is there an extent to God's sovereignty? God is still on the throne of this entire universe and is working out his ultimate plan for us as well as the whole world. His plan will, which will result in rightly glorifying himself and bless undeserving mankind by God's amazing grace because of the Son, Jesus Christ. God is in total control. So he asked, what is my responsibility in all this? If God is in control of my life, do I have any choice in the direction or what happens in my life? We're going to pick this up in a future study, this question. Because there's got to be a balance, right? There's got to be a balance. And God gives you and I a volition. What are we going to do with it? Real quickly, I'm going to tell you about these two men, a story of sovereignty. This kind of moved me, this story. 
I know we're, we're getting close on time. In 1941, on December 7th, Commander Mitsu Furuchishi was leading a squadron of Japanese fighters, bombers, planes that were flying over Pearl Harbor. This was the 39th birthday, this, this Japanese commander. The American fleet was 3,000 meters below them as they flew over. And he made the command to all squadrons plunge into attack, and they attacked the United States, and the war began. What followed was, in the words of President Roosevelt, this was a day that will live in infamy, and eight of America's battleships in the harbor were destroyed, and 14 other ships were sunk or destroyed, and 2,300 Americans lay dead or dying, trapped in the hulls of these ships. This commander, Fuchida, later described this as the most thrilling exploit of his career. At the same time, Jacob Deschalzer, he was in the U.S. Army Corps, and he was peeling potatoes in Oregon. Upon hearing this news, he was instantly angered, and he threw a potato against the wall as it exploded. And he said, these Japs are going to pay for this. They're going to pay. Jacob Deschalzer joined the military corps for a reason of fighting for his country. He loved his country. And so he was picked to be part of the special squadron of the Doolittle Gang, whose mission it was to take this war directly to the Japanese during a raid of, over Tokyo with B-52 bombers. Jacob DeShader. He was in one of these B-52 bombers. This American attack for American fighters took place in August 18, 1942, so just four months later. You know, in military terms, this was just a pinprick in what the whole war was, but it was a tremendous morale booster for the American troops, and it was crushing for the Japanese. DeShazer's B-52 bomber ran out of fuel before he could reach a safe area in China, so he bailed out in Japan, and he was captured by the Japanese, and he was thrown in a prisoner war camp for 40 months. 34 of these months he spent in solitary confinement, where he was routinely beaten, starved. He had a burning hatred for these Japanese. DeShazer's confinement gave him time to ponder his human condition. He wondered what could cause such hatred among fellow Americans. Barely remembering his Sunday school lesson from childhood, he asked the Japanese guard for a Bible. He wanted a Bible. After two years asking for this Bible, he finally got one. He read through the pages. He just gulping down everything that was in the Bible. These lessons from Sunday school come back to him about forgiving people and redemption. DeShazer later wrote, I discovered that God has given me new spiritual eyes. And then when I looked at the enemy who had beaten and starved me and my comrades so cruelly, I found my bitter hatred for them change from <laughs> loving pity. He just he pitied these poor Japanese people. When, once he's seen God's forgiveness, and he prayed that God would forgive his torturers, and he determined, he was determined to share the message of the gospel with these guys, with these people that were beating him. August 20th of 1945, a smiling Japanese guard swung the door open to DeShazer's cell and said, the war is over, go home. <laughs> what a feeling that must have been. You know, the Japanese commander, Furuchichi, was in Hiroshima the day before the atomic bomb was dropped, but he was called to emergency meeting in Tokyo. He was the only Japanese fighter throughout this whole war to survive this war from beginning to end. These two bitter enemies met in October of 1948 in Tokyo. DeShazer was handing out leaflets in Tokyo with the title, I was a prisoner of Japan. The Japanese commander was so intrigued when he seen these pamphlets, he wanted to read them and he read them. And upon reading it, it said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Your Furuchichi later wrote, I was impressed 
And I was certainly one of those for whom Jesus prayed for all the men I killed, for I did not understand the love of Christ. This man, Furichichi, later became an evangelist in Japan, sharing the gospel with many people. As I read this story, and I couldn't imagine the sovereignty of God for all this evil, all this bad happened. Look at how God used this for his glory. It's just moving for me. These two men and the sovereignty of God in their lives. Tishazer went on to be an evangelist as well. Yeah, I don't know what he, what he believed on the gospel, but he shared the word of God with many, many people. So God is working in our lives in different ways that we don't understand sometimes. But we trust his word. There we take comfort. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We just thank you for your sovereignty. We know that you're in control of all, and we know that you have a, a love for us, a tremendous love for us, a love that sent his own son to die and pay the penalty that we owe on the cross. Lord, And we just thank you for that payment Jesus Christ made, and we thank you that you freely offer us eternal life. Anyone who wills can have eternal life by simply placing their faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you as you're working in our lives. You're sovereign behind the scenes, Lord. We just pray that we would trust your will every day of our lives. So we thank you for our time tonight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. With that, we are dismissed.